This is a 2008 Honda S2000CR, and it's one of my very favorite sports cars from the mid-2000s. Yes, with all the sports cars from the mid-2000s to choose from, even the very expensive ones, this is one of my favorites near the top of my list. And today, I'm going to review this S2000 and explain why. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era. We've had some great sales recently on Cars and Bids, including this 2013 Mercedes C63 AMG, which sold for $33,000, this 2017 Porsche 911 Carrera 4S, which sold for $100,000, and this wonderful 2005 Toyota Land Cruiser, one owner, sold for $31,500. $500. We've done a great job with Land Cruisers on cars and bids. If you're looking to sell your cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, cars and bids is the place to do it. You'll get the most money, the most views, and the most interest in your car. And if you're looking to buy a cool car from the modern era, check out carsandbids.com for an amazing selection of daily auctions of cool cars. So let's talk S2000CR. The S2000 first came out back in 2000, and it debuted with a 2-liter 4-cylinder that had 240 horsepower. In 2004, they updated it, the engine grew in size, and so did the torque figure, along with a few other changes. But the best was yet to come. And the best was this. At the tail end of the S2000 run, Honda finally decided to create something of a performance version. They called it the S2000 Club Racer, or CR for short. Power was the same as the regular S2000, but there were a bunch of little changes designed to improve performance in other ways. This car was only offered for the 2008 and 2009 model years and only in the North American market. Market, and Honda only sold about 700 of these S2000 CRs total, so they're really rare. And then the S2000 was canceled, and it was the last manual transmission sports car Honda ever really gave us. This was the end of the line to a degree. The original NSX was gone, the S2000 was going away, and this was something of a going away party. As you can imagine, these have become tremendously desirable with low mileage examples selling for well over $100,000 in the last couple of years. And today, I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a tour of the S2000 CR and show you all of its quirks and features, along with the distinctive upgrades for the CR model. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the S2000 CR by going over some of the upgrades Honda did to make the CR more desirable and performance oriented. For one thing, this car has stiffer suspension than a standard S2000 from this era, which obviously makes it ride a little rougher, but then it handles a little better too. It also has a tighter steering ratio compared to a regular S2000 from this era, which makes the steering feel a little tighter, a little quicker to respond, which is nice. The CR also got upgraded tires, a better tire all around, but the rear specifically are 10 millimeters wider for slightly better grip compared to a regular S2000. And speaking of the tires, the CR also got its own distinctive wheels, which were different from the ones in the regular S2000, a little darker, and they came with black lug nuts. One of those little details that helps set apart the CR from the regular model. Probably the most obvious change, though, at least from the outside, is the body kit that Honda gave the CR models, which was intended to improve downforce. You had a front lip spoiler that was more aggressive than what you got in the regular S2000, but more importantly, you had a rear trunk spoiler, which was absolutely massive, just a huge body-colored painted spoiler back there, again intended to improve downforce, make this car grippier, and handle a little bit better. But probably the most important change to the S2000 CR, at least from an ownership perspective, is this car has no roof. 
<laughs> That's not actually entirely true. Honda sold every S2000 CR with a hard top, a black painted hard top, regardless of what color your CR was, all the hard tops were black, and that was your roof. But they removed the folding soft top that all of the other S2000 convertible models had. So you didn't really have a roof with you in most situations. If you're driving it like this with the top off and it started to rain right now, I would just be screwed. There's nothing I could do to get a roof on this car. It doesn't have a folding convertible top like all of the other S2000s, which is kind of strange. Now, in place of the convertible top in the back, you can see they have this body colored panel behind the seats, which looks cool, I admit. It gives it sort of a roadster special look, but that wasn't the only benefit of removing the top. Honda was also able to add chassis bracing in the area where the convertible top would fold down since they didn't need that spot for a folding roof anymore. And when you go into the trunk, you can pull off these pins and the trunk carpeting, and then you can get into this area and you can see the chassis bracing is there. This obviously made the car more rigid and improved rigidity handling, made the car more performance oriented. One other thing I love in this trunk area, you can see a little cutout for the spare tire in here, which normal S2000 models have, but this one doesn't. There's no spare at all. They used the same carpeting, but the spare is gone to save weight and because the chassis bracing is in there instead. So the spare is gone, but you have like a little bump reminding you where the spare was in the lesser normal models. By the way, one other notable item with the top area, obviously behind the seats, you have this yellow painted panel, but if you look closely, you can see sort of next to the seat, there is a separate yellow panel here that actually comes off. You turn this screw, loosen it, and then you pull off this little separate yellow panel. And that's where you can see the latching point is to put the roof on if you want to install the black hardtop that came with the car. Obviously, when you don't have the hardtop installed, you put this yellow panel on and it looks a little bit better than having the ugly top latching points just sitting out there exposed. And next up, we move inside the CR where there are a few more changes in here compared to the regular S2000. For one, you had fake carbon fiber. You can see it here in the center in the console and also in the center control stack here, fake carbon look. This car came from an era when carbon carbon fiber was still pretty expensive, kind of hard to come by, so they went with fake stuff, but it does look kind of neat, very mid-2000s, and it set apart the CR from the regular model. You also have a different shift knob in this car, a little bit different from the one you get in the S2000, with a slightly different shifter feel as well, and probably most important, inside the CR, in the CR models, air conditioning and a stereo were options. You had to get them as optional extras. This was the track-focused S2000, and so they figured some people might not want that. Obviously, virtually every S2000 CR was ordered with those options because most people do want them, but they were indeed options. And if you didn't get them, the S2000 CR could weigh up to 90 pounds less than a regular S2000. So there was a lot of weight saving stuff in this car, including potentially deleting the radio and the air conditioning. And speaking of CR stuff, you can see right here the original window sticker to this car, sticker price just under $38 thousand dollars, which was big money at the time to spend on a four cylinder Honda that was starting to become a very old car. This is a 2008 model that had come out in 2000. It was really seeming like it had run its course and not that many people bought CR models back then. In fact, I remember when this car came out, it was kind of considered to be a cynical end of the run model to try to get a few more sales out of the S2000 by throwing a spoiler on it and calling it a performance version and not that that many people bought them. But in the years since, this has sort of become the S2000 to have, the last manual performance Honda and sort of the GT3 version of it. And this is the one that everybody wants. And since then, values have skyrocketed and these routinely change hands for way over that original sticker price, even though dealers could hardly sell them for that price back when they were new. But anyway, beyond all the CR stuff that's unique to this car, let's go over the other quirks and features of the S2000 because there are very many. This is a surprisingly quirky car considering how small it is. You start when you just open the door and you see the door sill says S2000 manufactured by Honda Motor Company LTD. Why doesn't it just say Honda? Why does it say like the full legal business name? 
<laughs> I have no idea. But the quirks continue when you climb inside and you notice the cockpit feel of this car. Really crazy. All the controls are basically pointed at the driver with almost none available to the passenger. Over on the right, you have the climate controls. All the climate controls for this car are integrated into this little panel here. Again, pointed directly at the driver and easy to control while you're driving. And you can see the little dial that lets you control airflow. One of the pictures is actually a little convertible meant to signify the S2000, which I think is a pretty neat quirk. Now over to the left of the steering wheel, you have an even quirkier control panel there, and that would be the stereo controls. You have a mute button, a volume button, a channel button to change the radio, and this big black button on the left will turn on or off the radio and switch between different modes like AM, FM, auxiliary, whatever. Now all these controls are pretty useful over there because you look in the center control stack and there's no actual radio. There's no like head unit in here that shows you what you're listening to. All the controls are to the left of the steering wheel, except they're actually not. The radio is hidden behind this little fake carbon fiber cover, which says on it S2000. S very large. And then it also has these little five dots on either side of the S2010 total. Anyway, you press one of those dots, this thing pops open and it reveals the radio head unit in there where you again have a volume button, a mute button, all the controls to the left of the steering wheel are duplicated on the little radio faceplate in the center control stack where you would normally expect it. Why did they do this? Because they wanted the most heavily used controls to be very much within reach of the driver. So you're on a racetrack in this car, you're driving hard on some back roads. You don't have to like look down at the radio and reach down there. Instead, the controls are right at your fingertips. And of course, the other benefit here is you can just lie to your passenger. If you want to be the only one controlling the radio in this car, you can do that. Tell your passenger, oh, there's no other controls. Sorry, just not available to you. <laughs> And by the way, speaking of hidden stuff in this car, there's a surprising amount of hidden items throughout this interior. For instance, cup holders. You look at the center console and you can see there are no cup holders here, but if you press this little button, again with five dots on it, just like the radio button, you press that and it slides open this little lid and there you have some storage where you could theoretically stick cups or other storage needing items. Now also in this car, you don't have a glove box, but you can see hidden below where the glove box would be there are these little storage compartments where you can put stuff. Not immediately obvious that there's a storage compartment down there, but there is if you know where to look. Now the glove box for this car has been really relocated to between the seats. You can see here there's a little latch with a lock on it and you can lock or unlock this little storage compartment underneath this lid and that is essentially your glove box. But you open this up you'll find another hidden item and that would be the trunk release in this car. It's nowhere else it's just in this center little storage compartment that you can lock in case you give this car to a valet and you don't want them to get access to your trunk. And by the way, one other hidden item in here, directly above the center storage compartment, there's another storage compartment that's hidden. This entire panel lifts up, including the wind deflector, to reveal a relatively large storage compartment hidden between the seats you wouldn't really know is there unless you know what to look for. And this is where the owner's manual lives in this car. It's a large enough compartment you can get the whole owner's manual in here or whatever else you want. This is your center storage compartment area. But beyond all the hidden stuff in this interior, there's still more quirks to discuss, starting with the power window lockout. Now, a lot of cars have a lockout for the windows, so you can like prevent your kids in the back from rolling up and down the windows and annoying everyone. This car has it too, which is a little odd because it's a two-seater, but you can turn on this window lockout and then your passenger can't roll up or down the passenger window. That's kind of strange because this car is so small there's only two windows you don't always see a window lockout on a car like this but the really weird part is when you turn on the window lockout the driver's window control also can't roll up or down the passenger window <laughs> when you have the lockout on the passenger window cannot be rolled up or down by anyone in the car at any point so really that switch just disables the passenger window from anyone's control not just the passengers kind of strange and speaking of the passenger another interesting quirk in the s2000 
is in the passenger footwell where you have this bulge, a rather large one actually, robbing some foot space from passengers. And it's not like this car has a lot of foot room to begin with, so it'd be nice if that wasn't there, but it is. Some sports cars do have stuff like this. There's mechanical components under the floor that they just can't put anywhere else. And the S2000 is one of those cars, a little bulge in the passenger floor area. Next up, another interesting quirk is the button to turn on the cruise control to the left of the steering wheel. Under the gauge cluster, you have this button, which is oddly shaped. It sort of curves with the gauge cluster and you push it in and it's even more oddly shaped. Definitely a strange button there. One of the strangest, in fact. Would have been odd for a supplier to create. Another interesting button related item is turning this car on. You insert the key and twist it in the ignition like so many cars, but that doesn't turn it on. Instead, you also have to press the engine start button to the left of the steering wheel. This car came from the era where cars had a push button starter, but you still needed the key. There were a few weird years in there when that was true, and it's true on this car. And speaking of buttons, another rather interesting quirk is in the very center of this interior, the center console right in the middle of everything, sort of the focal point of the entire interior, you have a rear window defroster button, which is a neat trick in a car that doesn't have a rear window. <laughs> that button is front and center. Although when you install the hardtop, there is a little electrical connection that you plug in and then that hooks up the rear window defroster. So yes, this button does work. Although I imagine 99% of the time this car is being driven, it is completely irrelevant, even though it's in the middle of everything. Now you can see to the left of the rear window defroster, there's a blank button here, a circle. That, of course, would be for the top in the regular S2000, not needed in the CR since they removed the regular folding top. And one more interesting quirk in this car, you have a fully electronic gauge cluster, which was very unusual to see in a car from this era. It was more common in the 80s, but this car has it too. And when you turn the car on, you can see all of the gauge cluster lights briefly light up, which is kind of cool to see. And you can also see here the 8,000 RPM red line that this car was so famous for. The tack goes all the way up to nine at its highest point. And you have the digital speedometer right in the middle telling you how fast you're going. You can also press this little button on the side to switch instantly between miles per hour and kilometers per hour, which is kind of a neat trick. You drive this into Canada, you just tap that button and you're good to go. But that is a pretty cool gauge cluster and it was a very unique characteristic feature of the S2000. And next up we move outside the S2000 CR where there are a few quirks and features worth noting. I'm going to start in the trunk, which actually isn't really all that notable. Reasonably large size for a car this small, but I showed you the cool stuff earlier, the chassis bracing where the top would have been and the like fake spare tire bump. Nothing else particularly interesting in the trunk. I do like the taillights back here though. These sort of circles inside a clear taillight cover. Kind of a throwback to the old era when cars had these and they were cool. Now everybody's moved to LEDs and cool lighting designs and this stuff you don't really see as much anymore. One especially cool lighting quirk with this car is in the front, the headlights. The US government requires that all cars sold in the United States have a little orange reflector on the side in the front front and car companies integrate it in various different places. The S2000 is especially weird. It's sort of in the middle of the headlight housing. Usually it's right on the side or on the bodywork on the fender, but here you can see it mounted in the center of the headlight. Kind of a strange place for it, but that's how they chose to comply with that regulation. Interesting. By the way, one other notable item on the outside, you can see a CR badge back here, which of course stands for club racer, like I mentioned before. You also have CR badges on the fenders, but those were the only exterior badges that let you know this was the special S2000. The wing was really the giveaway. Also worth noting, Honda only offered the CR in four colors. You had yellow, you had a bright blue, you had black and white. That was it. Couldn't get the CR any other way. And finally, we move under the hood and you can see the engine. 2.2 liter four cylinder, 240 horsepower. This was unchanged from the regular S2000 from this era. All the performance upgrades were limited to the stuff I showed you before. The wing, the suspension, the steering ratio, et cetera, et cetera. The engine was untouched. Now, one of the complaints with this car was torque. When the S2000 first came out, it had 240 horsepower, but only 153 pound-feet of torque. Now, in 2004, Honda enlarged 
enlarged the engine and increased the torque figure a little bit, but not all that much. Between 160 and 170 pound feet, still not a huge torque figure for this car. And that was kind of always one of the drawbacks of the S2000. One interesting thing you can see in the engine bay is where the engine is placed pretty far back behind the front axles. This is a true front mid engine car, which is actually pretty impressive because it's a small car. So to be able to get the engine behind the axles and then the passenger compartment with enough room for people and a fairly large trunk, it's pretty good packaging in the S2000, as you can see. And so those are the quirks and features of the Honda S2000 CR. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the S2000 CR. I've driven a few S2000s. I have never driven a CR before. First thing you notice when you get inside this car, something I've forgotten a little bit, it's tight in here. I'm six foot three, six foot four. This is a tight interior. Back in the day, in the 80s, Japanese cars were kind of known for being smaller inside uh, because obviously the Japanese people are generally smaller. But by this era, they had realized like, hey, we're making global cars. We really ought to make them a little bit bigger. But this car is tight. It's, it's uh, my height, I think, is probably about the maximum for someone in one of these. The other thing you notice when you get in this car that I had forgotten, I hadn't forgotten, but a good reminder, it is sublime. It is wonderful in here. I love the way that this car drives. The gear lever and the clutch are fantastic. The clutch is light, but not too light. Uh, just enough that you know you can easily feel where the engagement point is very linear very easy to use the gear lever is really nice the shift knob that's unique to the CR kind of changes the feel of the gear lever a little bit and actually makes it feel just a little bit more like heavier is the wrong word it's not in a bad way it just feels a little bit more kind of precise and it's nice it's really really wonderful but obviously the most important and best thing about this car is the way that it handles the owner of this car was very generous. He said, take this thing out, throw it around, do whatever you want. That's what it's made for. Even though it's a low mileage car, these are now very valuable. This one's probably worth $70,000 or up. Um, twice its original MSRP almost. But I did, I have been throwing it around and driving it. It is a blast. The steering is so good. The handling, the steering is incredibly precise, just instantaneous responses. But the handling is the thing that's most impressive about this car. Dead flat and it, it just feels like you it will you can throw it anywhere and it'll never get out on you or become too unwieldy or too aggressive it is just perfectly tuned to be thrown around and enjoyed and not go crazy with that said part of the reason it won't go crazy is because it's not really all that fast Four years ago, I did a review on an S2000, an AP2, and it was kind of before my normal format and the video is very short and it wasn't really a full review. And, and I've always wanted to do a CR, the ultimate S2000. But back then, I loved the car. I was like, why do people complain this is slow? It's not slow, it's great, it's fun. Well, four years uh, have gone by since then and car performance has changed a little bit and my perspective has changed a little bit. And I now think this car by modern standards starting to feel a little slow to be totally honest uh, and it's not just because I drive supercars every day blah 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 like you see Focus ST Focus RS like Golf R cars that are relatively affordable this one it just kind of feels a little bit uh, it's not slow it's just not incredibly fast now I will say it does come alive above 6,000 RPM and really go for it but you gotta really work to get up there, and that's a lot of work. Overall though, that's not what this car is for. It's not intended for speed. That never was its purpose. It's a fun car to throw around. You toss it around and enjoy, and it's so exciting on canyon roads, on tracks. That's what it's for, and that's what it's still amazing at. Now, I do wanna make one other point. It's kind of funny. Uh, this car, I said earlier, you know, it was not viewed with that high regard when it first came out. That is true. People who don't have a lot of perspective or weren't around then or paying attention won't remember, but I do. When this car came out, people were like, oh, it's this cynical cash grab by Honda. They just want more money. They're throwing a wing on it and they're gonna, you know, charge more just to try to get a few more sales out of this old car. Because the S2000 was almost 10 years old when this debuted. And people didn't really want it all that much. It was a hard sell. Dealers had a tough time selling them. 
But what ended up happening is there's now this focus around the last best version of cars. And this sort of has a rep for being the GT3 of the S2000. And the S2000 itself has a strong rep. And so these cars have flourished in terms of their values. Nice ones have brought over $100,000. This is a very special and very desirable car and with good reason. But it's just funny to think back to 2008 when these weren't as special and now it's like an icon. And so that's the Honda S2000 CR, the club racer. This was an amazing car. The regular S2000 was really cool, and this was even better. It's funny, like I mentioned, this was sort of a run-out model back when these cars were new. Honda had tacked on a few extra bits to try to sell some more S2000s just as the recession came in, and people were kind of skeptical of this car. But now it is quickly becoming an icon, a legend, and I'm thrilled. I had the chance to check it out. And now it's time to give the S2000 CR a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the S2000 is a nice looking car, very handsome in fact. The upgrades to the CR are a bit much in terms of styling, that big wing, but overall it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in the low 5 second range and it gets a 5 out of 10. Handling is excellent, fantastic steering, fantastic handling, fantastic balance, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Fun factor is also really high, it's just a blast to toss around and so confidence inspiring, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is decent too, the regular S2000 is pretty cool, but the CR goes a step further and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 34 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The CR is fine, it has the necessities, but nothing excessive, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is only okay, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is good, these are known to be reliable, and materials are nice enough, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a car like this, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, value, and these have gotten really expensive. Nice ones are bringing $100,000, and that's big money for an S2000, no matter how special or rare it is. This is a special and rare car, though, and it drives well, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 22 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 56 out of 100, which places it here against relevant cars. The S2000 CR ties the regular S2000. The CR gains a point in cool factor, but it loses a point in value, which makes sense. Overall, the S2000 and the CR are both tremendously enjoyable cars. A little slow, a little impractical, but so much fun. And it's no surprise CR values have started to take off, given that it's the ultimate version of a fantastic analog sports car. 